gospel reading today, we find ourselves in this strange period at the cross, at the end of the Sabbath. For those of you who are not familiar with the Jewish customs of the Sabbath, and as I said this morning, I'm certainly not an expert in Jewish customs. I admitted that my knowledge probably comes mostly from Fiddler on the Roof. Um, so, but the Sabbath runs from sundown on Friday night until sundown on Saturday. So where our story picks up very late on Saturday, between the sorrow of the cross and the joy of the resurrection, we have this really strange account of the women rushing out in the dark for some late night shopping. They needed to buy spices for burial. This kind of surprised me as I looked at the scriptures because I've never really thought about late night shopping as anything other than a modern invention. But here we have these women rushing and hurrying to get to the shops before they close. You can probably imagine that panic they've got, um, as we've all probably been there trying to get to the shops, thinking, oh, just quick before they shut. And that panic is they're thinking about the spices that they they need for their friend. Rising really early the next morning, these women gathered and hurried along the road to give their friend a proper burial. In the previous chapter of Mark, he tells us that these women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had been traveling and ministering to Jesus since he began his ministry in Galilee. Mark opens his account of the gospel with Jesus' baptism and the ministry beginning in Galilee. So these women have traveled with Jesus the whole journey, from the beginning at Galilee to the foot of the cross, and now to the final burial. These women had been with him as they performed miracles taught the scriptures and had been welcomed into Jerusalem in triumph as the Messiah. As I was thinking about these scriptures, it struck me for the first time that these women must have been with Jesus when he told his followers three times that his death on the cross was to be expected. In Mark 8, 31, he says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes and that it must be killed and after three days rise again. So these women approach the tomb in reverence to honour their friend and teacher in death. As Mary, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, arrived at the tomb, they gasped. Their jaws probably hit the ground as they saw the entrance to the tomb was open. They probably crept into the tomb and I wonder what they were thinking as they looked towards where Jesus had laid. Whatever it was, it wasn't that blunt young man who said, women, why are you stunned? Don't just stand there in shock. You are looking for the dead Messiah. He told you he's not here. Jesus has risen from the dead and he has gone back to the start to meet you at Galilee. We can think about what the women's response was. Like many in the Bible, when confronted with the impossible, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome responded with fear. They were terrified and fled the scene, telling no one. What a strange response, we might say, to the news that the Messiah was not held by death. They knew he would rise. He had told them he would rise, and he indeed risen, and yet they, he, and yet they responded with fear. But who responded, we would expect, racing with joy to tell the disciples of what had happened. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The original text, our oldest account of Mark, ends here. We don't hear about the twelve who locked in the room, too afraid to visit the tomb. What a strange way for Mark to close the gospel with no closure. So what's in this story for us? What kind of closure what might we find for ourselves in the story? These faithful women travelled with Jesus the whole way of his ministry. They had left behind aspects of their life to follow him. Yet in these moments, their actions do not align with their beliefs. They did not truly believe his promise in the darkest of all hours, that he would conquer death and he would rise again. They had been there, they had heard the promise of the Lord. Jesus didn't use parables or stories to collect this message. Like a patient 
Asia with an important message. He was very clear and repeated it. You might be sitting there thinking, but of course they struggled with that. It is impossible for the dead to rise. And it really does challenge our thinking, doesn't it? Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He rose from the dead and conquered it. So we might ponder and think, what does the empty grave mean when we're faced with the death of a loved one or even our own deaths? An empty grave means that as followers of Christ, we don't need to be afraid because we too have that promise that we will rise again. And I wonder if, like Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, our belief stays at the foot of the cross with the expectation that the grave is still full. What clear promises have we missed or not believed because it seems too large and too impossible? For a long time in my own Christian walk, I remained waiting, waiting for Jesus to come back, that then he would be in power and put all things right. But why was I waiting? Yes, Jesus is going to come back, and yes, he will put all things right. But he is in power now. We recite that promise every time we say the Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So he is on the throne now. That's not a future event. Maybe right now, we also feel like we're waiting in the silence, in the sorrow of Saturday. Like these women, we experienced God's power and wisdom in the past. We journeyed with him from the heart, but where we are right now, we're alone and we're frightened. But even in his silence, we don't need to be afraid. He promised us he would not leave us alone in the world. He would send us the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and comforter. The other question that Mark leaves us is what is our response when we witness God's power at work? What do we do? It's really easy to feel that the cost of sharing the message is too big. Like the women in this account, we might feel that too powerless to tell anyone. We might run away and pray. Or like the twelve, we don't even show up because we're locked in that room hiding. Even in this account, when Mark appears to end the story with doubt, there's hope. We know the story didn't end there because we have the account. They did tell someone. So we know what they did see that early first Easter morning. So it's not too late for us to tell others what Jesus has done. It's not too late to spread the good news that he is finished. Death, uh, Jesus has risen and death is defeated. Amen. <laughs> so let us pray.